I'd like to know specifically what it was about the last course that you did not enjoy. I take my work very seriously and you're not eating. Yes, I'm just not very hungry. I told you who I am. I'm Julian Slowick and I'm the chef here. Now, who are you? You know the address for Mom's trailer park, you asshole. No, it's not who you want me to think you are. Who are you? I am Margo. You shouldn't be here tonight. I'm excited. We're ready for our next course. Jeremy created the next dish. It's called The Mess. Jeremy is talented. He's good. He's very good. But he's not great. Like mine, his life is pressure. And even when all goes right and the food is perfect, there is no way to avoid the mess, Jeremy. Do you like this life, this life that you dreamed about? No, Chef. Mm -hmm. And do you want my life? No, Chef. Ladies and gentlemen, your fourth course, sous chef Jeremy's The Mess. Hey guys, what's happening? Niad here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, today we'll be exploring The Menu, the 2022 black comedy directed by Mark Malloyd, written by Seth Rees and Will Tracy. Starring Ray Fiennes, Hong Chow, Anya Taylor-Joy, Nicholas Holt, John Leguizamo, Janet McTeer, Judith Light and Reed Burney, the film both promises and delivers on a dining experience to die for. Inspired by Will's experience at the Cornelius Smots restaurant, an island restaurant outside of Bergen, Norway, and Louis Benwell's The Exterminating Angel, the menu is a wild ride into the dark side of fine dining. When the obsessive foodie Tyler, his last minute plus one Margot, and several high-profile people arrive at a remote island, they're informed their world-class chef Julian Slowick had prepared a menu unlike any other. Julian, once a talented cook that made burgers, went on to become one of the most celebrated chefs around the world, serving an affluent clientele. Unfortunately, the audience he catered to no longer cared for the food. For them, it was all about being consumers at prestigious venues and not the actual experience of eating the food itself. An evening at his remote restaurant, Hawthorne, designed for the extremely wealthy, is one of the most sought after experiences. Tonight, Julian and his temple of gourmet plan on serving an exquisite multiple course meal with a personal touch. The Epicurean meals and decadent presentation are symbolic representations of his life, his experiences, and the influence the wealthy diners had on the industry that he and others had dedicated their lives to. Sharp, brutal, tense, and quite often deliberately hilarious, the movie gives us a window into how obsession can both drive a person of exceptional talents to success and at the same time destroy them. The mess you make of your life, of your sanity, by giving everything you have to pleasing people you will never know. And I've been fooled in trying to satisfy people who can never be satisfied. But that's our culture, isn't it? As the elegantly dressed guests wait to board a private yacht to the remote island where Julian's restaurant was located, we're introduced to Tyler and Marco. While the highly strung Tyler is extremely nervous and excited to meet his idol, Margot nonchalantly lights up a cigarette, much to his frustration. Although she's a last minute plus one to the event, Tyler had been waiting for eight months to meet Julian and eat his revered food. Babe, please don't smoke, it'll kill your palate. Then my palate will die happy. With Tyler insisting that her smoking would prevent her from appreciating the delicate flavor profiles which have been painstakingly constructed for the night, Margot finally stamps it out. Joining them for the 1250 per head dinner are 10 others, wealthy couple Richard and Anne who have dined there multiple times, George, an aging film star that won't accept he's past his prime, his assistant Felicity, business partners Dave, Bryce and Soren, food critic Lillian and her editor Ted, and finally Julian's very own mother Linda, who they find waiting for them at the restaurant. Served a unique oyster dish with lemon alginate pearls during their ride, the responses of both Tyler and Margot to the food gives us an idea of how they perceive the dining experience altogether. Margot simply loves oysters and doesn't see the need for the pompous decorations, while Tyler is obsessed with the intricacy of its style and presentation. Love oysters. No. No, it's the balance of the products. You need the mouthfeel of the mignonette. Please don't say mouthfeel. Greeted on the pier by Elsa, Julian's right hand, and the maitre d' of Hawthorne, Margot is awkwardly questioned about not being on the list, alluding to the notion that she was a last minute replacement for Tyler's ex-girlfriend, something that Elsa doesn't appear to be happy about. What we assume is thinly veiled contempt for Margot is actually later revealed to be directed at Tyler for reasons we'll soon discover. Margot, welcome. 
We'll endeavor to make your evening as pleasant as possible. Thanks. Right this way. As Margot gives a last longing look towards the boat sailing away, Elsa begins their tour of the island, explaining that everything they eat has been grown, captured, and prepared for their delight. Here, Colin Stetson's amazing musical score captures the excitement, ferocity, and inevitability of nature, creating a wondrous but unstable feeling that lingers. Comprised of 12 acres of forest and pasture, and purchased in 1989, Hawthorne Island is a marvel to see. Contrasting its natural beauty is the rigid yet elegant style in which the buildings were designed and maintained. We use the meat of wow. dairy cows only, which we age for an astonishing 152 days to relax the protein strands. Oof. The militant approach to artistic perfection demonstrated in the restaurant experience is one shared by Julian's professional crew, who come off more like a cult than employees of a master chef. This is where we live. Well, you actually live here, all of you? All of us, except chef. Each day starts at six with five hours of prep work. Dinner is typically four hours and 25 minutes. Each day ends at well past two in the morning. So yes, it's best that we all live here. When Soren disrespectfully sits on one of their beds and asks if they ever get burnt out, Elsa explains that the chef and his staff held themselves to the highest standard. She then tells him that they never burn anything unless by design to make delicious, alluding to the shocking ending before guiding them to the restaurant. Passing by Chef's home, the group are informed that nobody, not even the staff, were allowed inside the cottage. Pointing out that she was not supposed to be here once again, Elsa reminds Margot that she'll be sitting in Miss Westervelt's seat, much to her dismay. Richard also tells his wife to swap seats with him, obviously annoyed about having been seated across from Margot. The ominous feeling that something weird is about to go down continues when the group are invited to observe the cooks innovate. Importantly, Elsa cautions them not to photograph the food, as Chef strongly felt that the beauty of his creations lay in their ephemeral nature. And here lies the main theme of the film, how food that is supposed to be enjoyed for the taste has now been corrupted by fine dining. The disdain of the staff towards the people they're about to serve is palpable. Watching the sous chef named Jeremy prepare a cold snow-like powder dish, Tyler tries to impress Margot with his knowledge. Telling him that he obviously knew his stuff with a smile and catching Tyler off guard by knowing his last name, Jeremy tells him to take a seat as they're about to serve. The attention is in the details, and the details scream at the audience to get ready for shit to go down. It's here we get our first look at Chef Julian Slowick, a brooding, intense, and utterly focused man gliding from station to station, making sure the food was of the utmost quality. Listening to Elsa whisper something in his ear, Julian sharply looks over at Margot, recognizing a shared sadness between them that he can't explain before resuming his work. In a coordinated ballet of movement, the servers arrive in perfect unison with an appetizer, compressed and pickled cucumber melon, milk snow, and charred lace. As they all begin to eat, the impetuous Tyler breaks the first rule by taking a photo of his food instead of simply enjoying it. At the same time, Felicity tells her boss that while she was thankful for the opportunity, she was leaving, something he jokingly ignores. Here's my uh, work them. phone. Here's the production company doing? credit card. Non and here is the key to your house in LA. Showing more interest in the food than the business bros wanting to get drunk, or the food critics wanting to deconstruct the food, Tyler gives a heartfelt breakdown of why he was so happy to be here. Though he's extremely passionate, his ramblings indicate that it wasn't the process or the food that he cared about, but the fact that others thought Julian's work was avant-garde. Chefs, they play with the raw materials of life itself, and death itself. It's art on the edge of the abyss, which is where God works too. It's the same. That was beautifully put, Tyler. As we stare out into the emptiness of the ocean surrounding them, we're met with a title card saying, First Course. Tasting something and closing his eyes in deep contemplation, Julian reservedly says okay before clapping his hands loudly to get everyone's attention. Turning around within a split second, his militant staff look ahead as he addressed the diners, creating a solar system of focus around him. Greeting them all with a smile, he welcomes the group to Hawthorne and introduces himself, stating that it will be their pleasure to feed them. The chef then describes the next few hours, an experience where they will all ingest fat, salt, sugar, protein, bacteria, fungi, various plants and animals, and even entire ecosystems. But they need to remember one thing, not to eat the food, but to taste, savor, and relish it, to consider every morsel they place inside their mouth. Telling them to look around, he then requests that they breathe deeply and accept all of it, to forgive and enjoy the food, a chilling message and warning that most of them don't decipher until the very end. On your plate are plants from around the island, covered in barely frozen, filtered seawater, which will flavor the dish as it melts. The island and the nutrients it provides exist in their most perfect state without us manipulating them or digesting them. 
While he was trying to get them excited for their meal, beneath the controlled perfection and presentation is a comment on how he considers all of their lives insignificant. And my man doesn't just talk to talk, he's prepared to walk it. We are but a frightened nanosecond. Nature is timeless. Enjoy. As he continues introducing the series of courses he'd prepared, Julian's monologues become increasingly unsettled. For the course titled Bread Service, he tells them that bread had existed for over 12,000 years, especially amongst the poor, given the simple ingredients of flour and water. Even today, grain represented 65% of all agriculture, while fruits and vegetables accounted for 6%. Ancient Greek peasants dipped their stale bread in wine for breakfast. Even Jesus taught people to pray, if not beg for our daily bread. Thus believing bread was for the common man and that his guests were far from common, Julian explains they will not be getting any bread. Instead, the servers bring shale plates, along with a note saying what the ingredients were to the bread they would not be eating. In this spirit, please enjoy the unaccompanied accompaniments. Despite acknowledging this was a wickedly clever conceit, ever being the critic, Lillian tells Ted that the emulsion looks slightly broken. This hilariously prompts Julian and his servers to continually bring her large servings of emulsion throughout the night. Miss Bloom, mm -hmm. here is another broken emulsion, courtesy of Chef Slowick. For the third course, uncomfortable truths about each guest, ranging from affairs to embezzlement, are exposed via laser-printed images on tortillas, beginning to show the true reason they were all assembled here. Unbeknownst to everyone, Julian had picked all of them to arrive tonight, with the exception of Margot, for doing something that he despised. Tyler is a rich faker that has convinced himself and others that he's a foodie genius from simply watching cooking shows, when he's never taken the time to either cook or actually enjoy the meals. George has been doing terrible films for the money and has lost his love for the craft. After watching his movie, Paging Dr. Sunshine, on one of his few days off, Julian resented the disregard for art from the fellow artist. George is even trying to transition into cooking shows, despite not having the skill or knowledge to do so. How is it? It's good. You can't just say good for the show. You have to embellish. Oh my God, but Carla, it's not brain surgery, okay? okay? It's, okay, it's so a goddamn it. travel food show. Yeah. His personal assistant, Felicity, on the other hand, has also been stealing money from him, despite coming from a financially sound background. As a child that had a very rough upbringing, Julian viewed her as the epitome of entitlement and living life on easy mode. When it comes to Ted and Lillian, their unjust critical food reviews had closed the fine establishments of many talented chefs. Thoughts? Because I'm really feeling this is quite... It's half great. It's there in moments. There in moments. Richard and Anne have visited Hawthorne multiple times because of their affluence, but they never enjoyed the experience and couldn't even name one dish from one of their previous visits. Eleven times. Mr. Liebrand, kindly name one dish you ate the last time you were here. God. It wasn't cod, you donkey. It was halibut. Rare fucking spotted halibut. Finance bros Soren, Dave and Bryce have no reverence for art or food and have been extorting their power to gain access to everything they ever wanted. Okay. Uh, whatever, at least we can say we've been here, right? My dad used to say that you buy the experience. Mm. We also learn that they're involved in fraudulent activity with their boss, Doug Varick. Not seen until later, we learn that Julian had to relinquish ownership of his restaurant to his angel investor to stay afloat during the pandemic. And despite knowing nothing about food or food preparation, the man had forced Julian to change his menu multiple times. This partly led to the chef losing love for his passion, but there is much more to be uncovered. Margot is the only wild card that Julian and the staff are not expecting. And amidst the dining experience, the chef furiously tries to figure out who she really is. This is spurred by the fact that she's the only one that refuses to eat his food, stating that she's capable of deciding what and when she ate. You haven't touched your food. There is no food. No, no, this is food. I want to fill up. That would not be possible. I've precisely designed the portions to account for that. Annoyed at not getting bread, the finance bros also complain and are surprised to hear Elsa refuse them, even when they try to leverage their relationship with Verrick. Okay. Uh, this is all very clever and I, I didn't want to pull this card, but you know who we are, right? Yes. May I? Uh, you don't have to do it. Okay. You will eat less than you desire and more than you deserve. Introducing them to the third course titled Memory, he explains it was designed to evoke them. As he recounted how he stopped his alcoholic father from strangling his now alcoholic mother to death by stabbing him in the thigh with kitchen scissors, the staff skewer the chicken they had prepared with scissors. Well, I suppose I should have stabbed him in the throat that evening, but we're not so smart when we're young. 
The rest of the food is then brought out, with laser printed images on tortillas of each guest and their activities, exposing many uncomfortable truths. This ranged from Richard's affair, the embezzlement the finance bros were involved in, pictures of Tyler taking photos of the food, images of the restaurants Ted and Lillian had destroyed, to the first movie that led to George not caring about the art form. George is also eventually forced to reveal that although he claimed to know Julian, the clout chaser had been lying all along. While everyone is either curious, agitated, or angry about the images, it's not until the next course that they realize the danger they were in. Annoyed that Tyler snapped at her when she was about to send the food back, Margot enters the bathroom to smoke, catching sight of one of the staff walking through the clearing with angel wings. Confronted by Julian, she's asked what it was about the last course that she didn't enjoy. The chef had noticed she'd barely eaten her food, and offended by this, is determined to discover why. Continuing to probe, he asks her who she is, unsatisfied by her response when she tells him her name was Margot Mills. With both of them trying to read each other, the chef tells her he doesn't care about who she wants him to think she is, and is only concerned about who she truly was. This is because the thesis of this dining experience hinges on whether she's one of the unappreciative customers or a hardworking staff member like him. In order to proceed, I have to know where to seat you. With us, or with them. It's really, it's very important. Laying a tarp before the diners, Julian claps to get their attention and introduces the sous chef Jeremy, who had created the next dish called The Mess. Admitting he was talented, but that he would never aspire to greatness, Julian tells them that he'd forsaken everything to achieve his goals. And even though the food ends up being perfect and the customers are happy, along with the critics, there was no way to avoid The Mess. The mess you make of your life, of your body, of your sanity. By giving everything you have to pleasing people, you will never know. With Julian finally introducing them to Jeremy's mess, the staff pull up the curtains as Jeremy pulls a gun out of his waistband and shoots himself in the head, causing everyone to freak out. The only exceptions being the unstable Tyler and Lillian, who tries to convince them it was all just theatre. Telling his wife that they were leaving, Richard gets up but is told to stay put by Elsa. Refusing to listen, he tells the concerned Anna that he could handle this, prompting Elsa to ask which hand he was going to be using. And with that, as Richard is held down by the staff, the diners helplessly look on as a server cuts his ring finger off. With the old man screaming and reality beginning to set in, they're all forced to take a seat as Julian explains it was all part of the menu. Inviting Margot to the kitchen, he then tells her that she is simply wrong. The entire evening had been painstakingly planned and she was not part of that plan, which is spoiling everything. In order for him to proceed, he needs to know where to seat her, with those who give or those who take. Asking if that would let her live, she's then told plainly by Julian that would ruin the menu as the plan was for all of them to die this evening, something his staff have all accepted. Giving her 15 minutes to decide, he tells her to take a seat and get ready for the next dish. Returning to her seat, she slaps Tyler for bringing her to this restaurant, but the disassociating lunatic continues to be awed by the experience. Realizing they can't break the windows or overpower the staff, the diners ask him why they were here and are told their ingredients in a degustation concept. Julian then goes around and explains his contempt for each of them. Lillian, my cherished early advocate, knows the damage she has done to so many livelihoods. No, 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 no. No, 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 you don't talk. Although his plan was menacing, it was not without purpose. Julian is punishing the diners because they're responsible for the pretentious elitism that now represented the fine dining industry. This ultimately eroded his joy for cooking over the years. Their ridiculous affluence propelled the industry forward, but it also widened the gap between the socio-economic classes. By making fine dining costly, they prevented the very people that would enjoy the tasting experience from taking part, thus taking the pleasure out of it all. Julian's dedication to the elite, who merely make a booking at his restaurant as a way of showing their status, had wore away at his soul. This resentment made him want to confront his shallow and inconsiderate clients and make them feel embarrassment, consequence, and hopelessness for the first time in their life. His decades of repressed hatred manifest with the presentation of Hawthorne's angel investor, Doug Verrick, bound and suspended above the water with angel wings. Drowning the man that put a leash on Julian's artistic expression, the chef begins the fifth course by allowing his female employee, Catherine, to stab his leg for sexually harassing her in the past. As the men take the opportunity Julian gave them to run away in a game of cat and mouse with the staff, the women join Catherine inside. Jaded by the fact that Lillian's review had destroyed her own restaurant, and by the knowledge that her idol was not perfect, Catherine reveals it was her idea to have them all die at the very end. With the men all captured, Julian discovers that Margot is an escort named Erin that previously served Richard, hence why he was trying to avoid looking at her. Not only that, but Julian reveals Tyler was invited personally, 
and knew all along that the dinner would end with everyone's death. He knew Eren would die, but knowing he needed a plus one, he was willing to let her suffer for his pleasure, showing the same lack of gratitude and disgust for service that enraged Julian. You wanted me here because... Why? Why? You said, Why? You said I know a lot about food. That's right. You're not like the others, are you? You're a cook. <laughs> Cooks belong in the kitchen. You look wonderful. Doesn't he look wonderful, Margo? Doesn't he look good? Yes, sir! He's a handsome boy. Thank you. I'm proud of you. Thank you, Sean. Tyler. Now, cook. This is why the chef humiliates Tyler, by getting him to cook a meal in front of everyone, which he obviously fails miserably. Wow, it's actually quite bad. Insulting his undercooked lamb and whispering something that causes Tyler to end his life, Julian declares that Margot was a server like them, before entrusting her with a key and asking her to collect the barrel from the smokehouse for dessert. Margot is now one of us, Elsa. Right, Margot? Yes. Yes what? Yes, chef. But with Margot sneaking into his home instead, she's attacked by a jealous Elsa, forcing Margot to stab her in the neck during the struggle. It's here the woman finds newspaper clippings of Julian's life and a framed Employee of the Month award with a young and happy Julian at a greasy diner, information that proves to be vital at the end. Finding an old radio, she also calls for help and returns to the restaurant with the barrel. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. With a Coast Guard officer named Dale then arriving, the diners are given the option of either telling him the truth, leading to his death, or letting themselves die to save him. While they all keep up the charade, when George is asked for an autograph, the actor writes a note begging Dale to help them. Like a member of the League of Shadows, Dale reveals he'd been using theatricality and deception to trick them all, as he was actually just another line cook in disguise. With the servers preparing dessert, the final meal of the evening, and knowing that her time is running out, Margot does the unthinkable, mocking his food by saying it was made without love, before ultimately saying she was still hungry. When asked what she wanted to eat, she tells him she wanted a traditional cheeseburger, putting a massive smile on Julian's face for the first time in years. I'll make you feel as if you're eating the first cheeseburger you ever ate, the cheap one your parents could barely afford. Show me. And for the first time in probably decades, the chef takes his time and great delight in making something he knew would be enjoyed. Taking a bite and emphasizing her absolute joy and pleasure with the food, and not its presentation or style, Margot cleverly tells him that her eyes were a little bigger than her stomach. Requesting to get the rest to go, she watches as Julian delicately wraps her food in a Hawthorne to-go bag. Paying him $10 for the meal, Margot gives a final look at the other diners and leaves after being encouraged to go by Anne. It's important to note that Margot is the only diner that wasn't wealthy or pretentious, and she ultimately saw his cuisine as food rather than an experience. She's a kindred spirit of sorts, someone who understands what it's like to grow up with very little, work in the service industry, and deal with some of the worst people. Do you enjoy providing your services? I used to. Do you enjoy providing yours? I haven't desired to cook for someone in ages. She didn't need to be punished as life was punishment enough, which is why he never wanted her to be a part of the menu. Adding salt to their injury, Julian resumes the final course, explaining the diners needed to take care of the bill first. As the group say their last goodbyes, accepting their fate, Julian tells them the final course was a playful twist on a comfort food classic, s'mores. With Margot taking the docked boat to escape the island, the servers cover the floor with crushed crackers and place marshmallow stalls and chocolate hats on the diners. Explaining the s'more was the most offensive assault on the human palate ever, he tells them what transformed the monstrosity was fire. With the staff delicately preparing the diners with intricate presentation, the group accept their fate, even calling him chef as he set the entire place alight. Out of fuel, Margot finally looks on at the explosive fire and enjoys her burger, having survived the ordeal. The film is in essence a reflection on exorbitant consumer culture and the superficiality of the wealthy. Their need to commercialize fine dining and turn it into an exclusive experience takes the love and enjoyability from the experience rather than making it better. His exclusive clientele was so concerned with the details that they couldn't enjoy the sustenance the food provided or savor the taste at all. Julian was angry because he didn't see the point in gentrifying an experience and making it inaccessible to most for the sake of exclusivity and status, especially when the meal wasn't even being appreciated. Wild, unsettling, and often humorous, the menu is a well-acted dark comedy that will keep you on the edge of your seat until the very end. It haunts me. 
drives me. What happens to an artist when he loses his purpose? Pitiful. I am a monster. No, was a monster. But tonight, everything I'm doing is pure, and last pain almost gone. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore the menu. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you for dining with us tonight. You represent the ruin of my art and my life. Now you get to be a part of it. And now our final dessert course is a playful twist on a comfort food classic. But what transforms this fucking monstrosity is fire. It warms us, reinvents us, forges, and destroys us. We must be cleansed. We can be subsumed and made anew. Thank you.